Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Linnea Anderson. On behalf of the First Fridays Committee and the Archives and Special Collections Department, welcome to our hybrid First Fridays and welcome to the in person and online audience members. This season's theme is It's All Fun and Games. We will investigate materials in the archives that are strictly recreational. Today's presentation will also be posted later on the University of Minnesota Library's YouTube channel, so you should be able to access it later. First Fridays is a monthly series of presentations made possible by a generous gift from Governor Elmer L. Anderson and Mrs. Eleanor Anderson in honor of former library director, Dr. Edward B. Stanford. The presentations are based on materials in the University Library's archives and special collections. A special thank you to Alan and Joseph from Middle English Interpreting, who will be providing ASL interpretation for today's presentation. If time allows, we will have Q&A at the end. Uh, Zoom audience members, if you have any questions for our speakers today, please submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please use Q&A and not chat so that we can keep track of your questions. In-person audience, please hold your questions until the end of the presentations. And there will be a tour after the presentations with Erin. Erin, are you here yet? Okay, we'll connect you with her later. So at this point, we will pause for a land acknowledgement. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for, our, for Native American students, staff, faculty, and community members. Our presentations today are Having a Ball, Minnesota's Jewish Country Clubs, presented by Kate Dietrich, archivist of the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives. And teeing off into the history of local Jewish country clubs, Kate will especially explore the women who were active in spaces where the unspoken maxim may have once been gentlemen only, ladies forbidden. And then our second presentation will be Recreation and Leisure Through a Cartographic Lens, presented by Ryan Matke, head of the John R. Borchert Map Library. The John R. Borchert Map Library collection contains over 600,000 maps, atlases, and aerial photographs. Discover cartographic items related to travel, tourism, books, games, sports, and more. And without further ado, we'll move on to our presentations with Kate. So good to see so many people in person. Thank you so much for coming. How Jewish is a Jewish country club? How inclusive is an exclusive place for excluded people? How do power structures play out when some members aren't given a seat at the table? All of these questions and answers coalesce into what I'm going to be speaking about today, the history of Minnesota's Jewish country clubs as told by spotlighting Hillcrest Country Club of St. Paul, in particular, their women's group. Through surveying these stories found here in the archives, I hope to open a conversation around a seemingly less examined and lost history. So the first golf course in Minnesota was associated with the Town and Country Club in St. Paul, which is a club that dates back to 1888. Their location was strategically situated between downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul on Marshall Avenue overlooking the Mississippi River. Their course, starting out with five holes, was established in 1893. Despite modest beginnings, courses shared with grazing cows, golf in the state of Minnesota exploded in popularity at the turn of the century. Other clubs with golf courses followed, Minicata in 1898, Northland Country Club in Duluth in 1899, and the Interlochen Country Club in 1909. Country clubs created by and for Jewish Minnesotans were established shortly thereafter. To understand why Jewish Minnesotans had to start their own club, we must acknowledge that anti-Semitism was prevalent here in Minnesota. 
While it remains up for debate if Minneapolis was the emphasis on the capital of anti-Semitism in the United States, as posited in Carrie McWilliams' famous 1946 article, Minneapolis, the Curious Twin, it is undeniable that the Twin Cities were openly hostile to Jews in employment, housing, and social settings. Entire industries, such as lumber, were closed off to Jews, forcing many into self-employment with their own businesses. Social organizations, such as the Rotary and Lions groups, would not accept Jews as members. Insurance companies would not cover Jewish policyholders. To be Jewish in the Twin Cities was to be, at times, separate. Private country clubs were, and are, by their very nature, exclusionary. There needn't even be a written policy of exclusion on the books to uphold exclusion. To gain membership, one must be sponsored by a current member. If no one will sponsor you because, say, you're Jewish and the community dislikes Jews, you can't join. Therefore, it is a de facto, de facto Gentiles-only club. Because of this, it makes sense that in the face of discrimination, Twin Cities Jews went on to establish their own spaces for community. Talks around the first Jewish country club date back to 1913, when Twin Cities Jewish leaders coalesced to explore the idea of a golf club to cater to both Minneapolis and St. Paul residents. Various locations were discussed, including one located near Como Park, another by Lake Josephine, and one at the site where the University Golf Club would later be established near the St. Paul campus. The groups eventually uh, go their own ways because they cannot decide. But the first Jewish country club, Northwood Country Club, opened in 1915 in North St. Paul and was only accessible to those who owned automobiles and could trek out that far. After World War I in 1920, the second Jewish country club op opened, Oak Ridge. Their location was farmland in Hopkins, south of Minnetonka Boulevard. Hillcrest Golf Course opened in 1921 in St. Paul. Next was Superior Golf Club in 1923, located in Golden Valley, which later became known as Brookview. Each of these courses went through various changes over the years, from private to public to private again, closures, revised courses, and new names. Hillcrest Country Club is where I'm going to focus our attention today, thanks to materials we have here in the Upper Midwest Jewish Archives that detail just a slice of their history. Opened in 1921, Hillcrest was located at the intersection of Larpenter Avenue and McKnight Road, just east of Lake Phelan in St. Paul. First designed as a simple private nine-hole course, their early years reflect the struggle to get the club on solid footing. They went public in 1927 in an effort to raise money to add nine more holes, then they went private in 1928, then public again in 1933. But in 1945, Hillcrest entered a new phase. The club was sold to a group of businessmen and was repositioned as the Jewish Golf Club in St. Paul. In 1949, President Jack Liebman's annual message looked back at their first four years of this new version of Hillcrest. He stated, quote, I have always felt from the beginning that our club could be the center of a beautiful Jewish communal life for our city a place for relaxation and social gatherings, a wonderful place for both ourselves and our children to meet their friends and make new acquaintances. Just how Jewish this club was is a topic that we will get to later. One season after the club restructured, the Hillcrest Women's Club was born, organized May 14th, 1946 by the board of directors at a luncheon meeting held at the Commodore Hotel, describes one scrapbook page. 16 women were nominated to the board by the membership at large, and they elected their own officers. The founding of the group made the paper. Women's Auxiliary formed at Hillcrest Country Club notes, quote, wives of more than 150 members of Hillcrest Country Club have organized a women's auxiliary. One of their main tasks was to organize the women golfers. A general historical note as I share these documents. All throughout these years, well into the 1970s, the women are often listed as Mrs. and then husband's name. This is a common practice of the time and many women seem to prefer being called Mrs. husband's name. To the modern viewer, it can be a little jarring and off-putting. I personally wanna know their actual real names. What if the woman wasn't married? But of course these women were indeed married as their membership to the club depended on their relationship to a man. 
as outlined in the constitution, quote, any woman is eligible for membership in Hillcrest Women's Club who is the wife or daughter, 18 years of age, of a member in good standing and upon payment of her dues to Hillcrest Women's Club. All widows are eligible upon payment of their dues. Here we see a list of club championship winners over the years, starting in 1946. Sue Crane crushed it for years. Their first record book outlines the golf tournaments starting in 1948 with penciled in notes like June 22nd, pitch and putt, canceled due to rain. It also notes days in August that were social days, as well as when Hillcrest golfers went to Superior Country Club and when Superior came to Hillcrest, which is tournaments between two Jewish clubs. The group was involved in social events beyond just golf as reflected here in showing those in charge of social day bingo and the Pioneer Press article with the headline, Ready for Party Day. While golf was seasonal, events at the club were not. A barn dance on October 14th, 1948. Put on your best plaids, checks, and denims for square dancing. The 1950 Hillcrest Country Club yearbook publication shows a flourishing club and its officers and board were leaders in the Jewish community. Alex Tankanoff was the founder of the Minneapolis chapter of the Anti-Defamation League and on the board of trustees at Hillel. Jack McKay was an associated press writer who made headlines covering vice like the Dillinger Gang. Here we have golf course rules, which begin to really illustrate the divide between men and women golfers. Tuesdays are classed as ladies day when men golfers are prohibited from teeing off from the first tee between 9.30 a.m. and 12 noon. In case we didn't already get the memo from the exclusiveness of a country club, this really makes it explicit. These are upper class women who do not work. They are golfing during the day. Women are then prohibited from teeing off from the first hole Wednesdays and Saturdays most of the day from 10.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., as well as on Sundays and holidays, they cannot tee off until after 1.30. Here's a page announcing the Hillcrest Women's Club. It lists the officers, board of directors, committee chairmen who are in charge of things such as house, dining room, social day, bingo, telephone, and golf. Again, all are listed as Mrs. Husband's name, identity through men, the calendar of events for 1950 shows us just how busy the summer golf schedule was. Weekly rounds of golf competition ranged. There's mixed doubles tournament with a trophy, a throwout contest, two ball foursomes, pitch and putt contest, total putts, blind bogey, blind putts, the director's cup, and the president's cup. From late May to early September, each week had an event to engage the women of Hillcrest. And all throughout these documents, we have rules, rules everywhere. This 1953 useful information for ladies flyer lays out the proper attire. All persons on the course will at time wear a shirt, sweater, or blouse. I don't know what else they would wear. Um, knee length shorts are permissible. There are courtesy rules. And then in all caps, it notes, as a matter of courtesy and the make of a lady, no member is to reprimand or unduly criticize any of the employees of the club. Grievances are to be taken to the proper committee heads for action. Imagine not complaining to the staff. The women's group appears to thrive throughout the 1950s with mention of their events regularly in the Pioneer Press. Their opening luncheon in 1959 was featured alongside with other events like the Calypso Carnival Dinner Dance in July as well as notice of who won tournaments like the President's Cup. But not everything was smooth sailing. The June 29th, 1959 meeting minutes mention, quote, an executive board meeting was held at eight o'clock at the home of Shirley Weitzman to discuss the possibility of dissolving the women's club. They go on to say, quote, the executive board discussed the possibility of discontinuing the women's club as a social group in view of the fact that we serve no definite purpose as far as the club at large is concerned. It was agreed that we organize as a golf group and a letter be sent to the men's executive board to this effect. It was voted on unanimously that we disband as a social group and reorganize as a golf group. To me, the key phrase here is, we serve no definite purpose as far as the club at large is concerned. The club, meaning the men. 
The women's group seems angry that their group was not receiving the respect or the platform they felt they deserved as they worked to create a social environment at the club. July 6th, in a letter to Dorothy, the president of the women's club, from the men's board. Quote, as secretary of the men's board, I am instructed to advise you that all of the directors were very disappointed over your decision to dissolve your organization. We feel that your club serves or should serve an extremely worthwhile purpose, and that lack of full and proper communication is mainly bringing about the situation prompting your decision. During the July 23rd Women's Club meeting, we see the resolution. Quote, after a meeting with the men, we reconvene and agree to remain active as a women's club organization with the following provisions, that we have three representatives attend the men's board meeting, that there be a representative from the men's board attending our meetings if necessary, and that there be a woman representative on each of the major committees that concern women, a reciprocal arrangement existed by our board to theirs. The motion was passed and the meeting adjourned. I'm intrigued because the discussion around dissolving this group was clearly not due to a lack of involvement or commitment on behalf of the women, but rather frustration over not having a voice regarding what was happening at the club that affected them. As the club became more and more popular, the women's group wanted recognition of their work and a say in club leadership. May 1965 meetings, meeting minutes note that the president of Hillcrest, quote, expressed the feeling of the club as being warm friendship, an idea trying to be created as oneness, a climate that depends greatly on the women. Praise was made to those dedicated girls who keep working for improvements. The women's club thrived in the 1960s with various successful tournaments and events. This 1962 flyer for a cheeky no men allowed roundup promises a full day of brunch, cards, golf, swimming, door prizes, and tournaments before a dinner. Note in the top right corner, it lists an all activity day for the whole Hillcrest Mishpacha, which is a Yiddish word for a network of family relatives and sometimes friends, kind of like a clan. One 1964 roundup flyer rhymes, quote, join us this day and let's have some fun. Sign up girls, each and every one. Your golf should really be a breeze as you'll be playing 18 holes from the men's tees. Card playing members, please come for lunch, make your own games and come in a bunch. And the women did seem to really take their planning seriously as seen in a prize and expense reports. Decent prizes were given out to tournament winners. Awards given out in 1963 include trays, salt and pepper shakers, a mustard pot, a cigarette dish, nut dish, or an ashtray to the novice of the year. A 1967 receipt shows the women's group purchasing a crystal zodiac, squirrel, rabbit, a snail, alongside large and small pewter pitchers and trays. 1969, we see a breakdown of each tournament and the prizes that were handed out. Again, a lot of pewter. The winners of the round robin tournament were aptly gifted large glass robins, except for the fourth place, which got an ugly baby, baby duckling robin. The group's expenses went beyond just prizes, including flowers, candy, tips, lunch for workers during guest day, postage, and printing. All told in 1967, the expenses were listed as approximately $900, which is the equivalent to being over $8,000 in today's money. This 1967 roster of women's golfers shows not only a growing group of women, but for those, those that know the St. Paul Jewish community, there's a lot of familiar names. The 1968 executive meeting breaks down the women's club members to 203 members. The meeting also mentions in September, there will be a full fashion show. Indeed, there were many other events year round outside of golf tournaments. There were dinners, dances, and parties of all kinds. It must also be pointed out that some of these events were typical of their time, meaning that the themes of the parties were sometimes stereotypes and sometimes racist. Quote unquote, Oriental Night was a common theme over the years, and one scrapbook includes a program for a minstrel show in 1957. No photos exist from that minstrel show that I could find, but the program does list people being in charge of makeup, so we can assume that there was blackface. A reminder that even within a space created due to discrimination, racist discrimination could still exist. 
into the 1970s, internal squabbles around issues of transparency and power between the men's group and the women's group return. The July 28, 1977 meeting minutes outline a proposal, quote, that the women's president be present at every meeting of the board of Hillcrest Country Club and that she or her alternative shall have one vote on all issues presented to the board. The group then made a motion to reprimand the board for neglecting to invite the president of Hillcrest Women's Club to their last meeting, while also asking the board to automatically appoint the women's club president to serve and vote on the board. Sounds familiar. The reprimand letter was signed by Leslie Shapiro, the reply addressed to Mrs. Husband's name. Board President Sam Rosenbaum wrote back, quote, please be advised that a reprimand is neither accepted nor acceptable. Your failing to receive advance of a meeting was the result of a human error on the part of the devoted and otherwise capable employee, Carol Brennan. He goes on to state, quote, regarding the question of women's full vote member, full voting membership on the board, you have previously been advised that the board is working towards that end, and I personally believe that this is long overdue. Within my memory, it is the first board to extend such consideration. As in the past, any aspect of this letter or any problem or suggestion is open for free, full free discussion, hopefully on an oral basis. So here's my modern day woman reading of that letter. How dare you? We're working on this. You should be so grateful that we are working on this. It'll happen someday. Please don't write me and leave a paper trail of your grievances. The fate of this decision, alas, is not found in the collection materials that we have, but it really is indicative of the fight that many women were having across America during the 1970s the right to have a literal seat at the table. Again, we see this struggle to access power here along the lines of gender within an organization created because the community experienced the struggle to access power. Which brings us back to the earlier question. How Jewish was this Jewish country club? Its founding members and leaders were undoubtedly Jewish, but did the club actually cater to Jewish members? How long were its members mostly Jews? I didn't really find concrete answers to my questions, but I did find Jewish influences at this club. A flyer for a fall event in 1951 notes a Yom Kippur dance, quote, our traditional affair after the high holidays, midnight supper. The 1975 bulletin board notes the club is quoted for Rosh Hashanah, but interestingly does not mention Yom Kippur, though it does say dinner off menu for the evening. The 1976 forecast, the club's newsletter, once again notes the club would be closed for Rosh Hashanah. Forecast also mentions a bus for members, shuttling people from Highland Park, a traditionally Jewish neighborhood in St. Paul, as well as from the St. Paul Jewish Community Center. I also tried to look at menus to see if what was being served was strictly kosher. One dinner menu I found for the Women's Club Roundup included shrimp, which is decidedly not kosher. One of the more compelling documents I found was a 1960s speech given by Rose Rosenberg. She spoke to welcome people to the annual Roundup Day and mark the end of the season. She encouraged members to, quote, volunteer your services in the interest of making Hillcrest the best and happiest little Jewish club in the USA. However, you'll see she crossed out little Jewish and hand wrote in golf and social instead, which I found curious. Was she trying to be more inclusive? Was she trying to downplay the Jewish influence? It's unclear. As I dug through the archives, I came across documentation relating to Hillcrest, Oak Ridge, and Brookview in the records for Jewish Federation. A copy of a form letter to a club member here from 1952 explains why. You are undoubtedly familiar with the bylaws of Oak Ridge Country Club, which states that, quote, the members must be responsive to their communal obligations. Communal here meant Jewish community. This 1951 document lists a few potential members applying for club membership and Jewish Federation staff replying with how much each member had supported Jewish Federation with financial contributions demonstrating their involvement in and commitment to the communal obligations necessary for membership. 
1956 Oak Ridge Country Club membership lists all of the members and their contact information and appears to list real or future contributions to Federation. Interestingly enough, once we get to the list of women members, there are no financial notations. They must not have been approaching women for contributions, their husbands seemingly the ones who controlled the financial giving. Brookview Club held the same requirements as described in a 1954 letter stating, quote, the fellowship and sociability we enjoy at Brookview should remind us of our good fortune in living in a country and a community where all of this is possible. As you know, the Minneapolis Federation for Jewish Service will soon campaign for funds for our fellow men who are not so fortunate, for the upbuilding of Israel and for the maintenance of organizations which are important to us in our community. The officers and board of our club are asking our members to give full support to the Federation campaign. Jewish country clubs, while social and recreational in nature, still found it important to uplift Sadaka the Jewish ethical obligation of charitable giving. Hillcrest Country Club and its women's club continued successfully through the 1980s and 90s, but Hillcrest was not always on strong financial footing. A 1978 letter to its members admitted that, quote, Hillcrest Country Club has been operating at huge losses for the past five years. These losses amount to $240,000, which covers the five-year period from 1972 to 1977. In 1993, another letter to members was sent, quote, to address rumors in regard to the sale of Hillcrest Country Club. It goes on to note, we have not actively sought, nor are we seeking any buyers or investors. The board rather is focusing on providing the service and facilities which the present membership desires. That did not last. In 2010, Hillcrest was sold for $4.3 million to the Steamfitters Pipefitters Local 455, and by 2017, the course closed entirely, ending this golf chapter after a 96-year history. The 112-acre site, now known as the Heights, is currently being redeveloped to support 1,000-plus affordable housing units while also creating new jobs in a neighborhood that needs it. In closing, the Hillcrest Country Club Women's Club records here in the archives provide us a peek into the history of Minnesota's Jewish country clubs. What I discovered as I was combing the archives was that sadly there isn't a large paper trail documenting this history. What we do have related to Jewish country clubs here in the archives are scrapbooks created by women's groups. Scrapbooking is a historically gendered task and in making these scrapbooks, these ephemeral documents like flyers, invitations, receipts from the women, not the men, were kept while not much else appears to have survived. A question I ponder often in preserving history, how might the presence or lack of archival documentation shift the narrative of a history? The women's voices survived to tell Hillcrest's history after all the fights with the board their voice is the final word. Their lens is now how we see this history. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Get myself situated here. Excellent. All right. Um, as uh, Lene mentioned before, I'm Ryan Mackey. I'm the Map and Geospatial Information Librarian here at the University of Minnesota Libraries. And um, I have over 50 maps to get through. So I'm going to jump right in. Uh, this is going to be more of a whirlwind tour than a deep dive in anything in particular. And hopefully it will show the 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 breadth of the map library collection and inspire you to come and visit us over in the sub-basement of Wilson Library. So I'm going to start with a the theme of travel and tourism. All right, so this map from 1907 is titled Map of the Canadian Pacific Railway, the Minneapolis-St. Paul and Sault Ste. Marie Railway, the Duluth South Shore and Atlantic Railway, indicating where sport is to be obtained. And you can see it's an, it's an overprinting of a, a map. And so the detail area here encompassing northern Minnesota that shows that duck, trout, bass, elk, moose, and small game are plentiful, um, as well as chicken. Um, 
I'm assuming it's prairie chickens, but it's hard to it's hard to tell. Uh, this map from 1896 has a unique perspective. You're looking from in the lower left here uh, has Minneapolis St. Paul. You're looking up towards Lake Superior in the kind of upper right there in Duluth. So this is a bird's eye view of the lake region of Minnesota and the St. Paul and Duluth Railroad. Um, so it was common in the late 1800s and early 1900s for railroad companies to sponsor these maps um, and promote uh, tourist destinations as they needed people to use the railways. Uh, this 1914 bird's eye view of Lake Vermilion highlights recreational opportunities in northern Minnesota. And in the details here, it has a particular focus on how to get to Tower, Minnesota. You can see a train um, down here in the bottom left. And the little diagram there shows how to get there by rail. And then there's kind of a, an array of ways to get to Duluth, which is how you, where you have to get in order to get to Tower. This is a 1917 map of the lake regions of northern Minnesota, and it was produced by the Duluth and Iron Range Railroad Company. It's one of the earliest examples we have of a canoe routes map, which highlights the area that is now the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, uh, lists where portages are and what side of the stream um, they're on. Uh, this is a similar map. This is uh, labeled the Playground of a Nation. Uh, there was a lot of push for tourism in northern Minnesota um, in the early 20th century. Uh, they had already logged everything, and so they needed to make money on it somehow. Um, I find this one particularly interesting because it is based on this Superior National Forest map produced by the federal government from 1920, uh, and then has overlays um, for the advertisements. And here you can see the map shows uh, canoe trips starting and ending at Ely, and some of these trips can be made with ease. Others should be taken only by the most venturesome. Um, and the suggestion that you can get to Ely from as far away as Duluth, New Orleans, or even El Paso, Texas. Uh, and this is one of the earliest examples we have of suggesting that tourists now use highways to get to Ely in addition to the railroads. Uh, this map from 1918, Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes, uh, it divides Minnesota into nine great playground districts, um, including some described geographically. There's the Mississippi headwaters and the North Shore boundary country, and some a little differently. Uh, bowstring country or the Lake Park region. Uh, this type of tourist map was very common in the in the first part of the 20th century. Uh, this map is from the 1930s. So this is Minnesota invites you to live, work, play in the playground of 10,000 lakes. And details include some advice. Um, come point your car to Minnesota's cool north woods um, or your blood will tingle with new pep in Minnesota's stimulating water, air and sunshine. No mosquitoes mentioned, that is correct. Uh, it also includes illustrations of fish species, um, as well as three different ways or multiple different ways here to get to the Twin Cities by car from Chicago. Um, so now that we're closer to mid 20th century, the focus is more on roads, uh, not on railways. This map also from the 1930s is a good early example of a pictorial map. Um, pictorial maps often had lists of information and facts, so I noticed that this one, if you look on the right-hand side, um, shows both a pottery center and a state prison. Um, the pottery center makes sense, that is in the area that seems to be Red Wing pottery. Um, the inclusion of the state prison in western Wisconsin is an interesting choice. Uh, these are two more examples of pictorial, or as the one on the left is labeled animated maps. Uh, the one on the left is a Vacation Land Special Edition from 1946. The one on the right is a Territorial Centennial Pictorial Map of Minnesota's Glorious Past, uh, published in 1949. Both were published by the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Um, I'm not going to zoom in on the details here, as the pictorial choices haven't aged particularly well. Uh, this one here, this is a lure land map of Aiken County, Minnesota from 1963. Um, and while the, uh, the acrostic there on the right-hand side is impressive, um, the detail I like from this map is Mr. Minnesota. Moving closer to the present day, uh, this is a 1984 Explore Minnesota map from the Minnesota Office of Tourism, and it is packed full of illustrations. So on the right-hand side here, you see the Bemidji Brainerd Lakes area. And here's the southwest area of the state. So you can see it's a little more kind of prairie and agriculture focused. And then if we go opposite to the Northeast Arrowhead region, definitely more kind of pine trees and wildlife. And I should say there is a bibliography link at the end. So if you want to see any of these maps, you can get to the catalog record. But that'll be at the end. Uh, this map from 1982 shows Minnesota fall color routes. 
uh, divides the state into six tourism regions with interesting names like Viking Land, Hiawatha Land, and Metro Land. Um, it also includes hunting and fishing information, uh, which is a little bit curious to me as the main focus is fall leaf colors, but it is published by the Tourism Bureau. So I guess they're you know, trying to attract visitors any way they can or just fill that awkward cartographic space on the eastern end of Minnesota. Um, all right, now I'm going to move on to sports and recreation. So this map is from 1950. This is St. Paul, Realm of Boreas Rex, winter sports capital of the nation, parades and pageants, skiing, sliding, skating. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, Boreas is the Greek god of the North Wind, uh, adapted here as the figurehead of the St. Paul Winter Carnival. And you can see around St. Paul, there's uh, details including the Super Toboggan Slide, the Winter Wonderland at Como Park, um, and various skating rinks in the uh, kind of Mac Groveland area. Uh, this 1998 map has a very specific constituency, um, but one never knows when a researcher will stop by asking about the distribution of disc golf courses in the Twin Cities in the late 1990s. Or maybe someone's newly interested in European football and they want to get a sense of the spatial distribution of club teams. So the impression you would get is that there are a lot of football clubs in Europe, um, though the density is maybe lower outside of England. Uh, similarly, we have baseball maps. So this map from the year 2000 is designed to allow the user to make a plan to travel to see all the different teams, as it shows the interstate highways along with the team locations. And it includes quite a few details, uh, as well as baseball attractions. Uh, for example, the Field of Dreams site in Iowa from the movie Field of Dreams. And some maps, while still cartographic at the core, contain a lot of cultural information. So this World of Baseball map, also from 2000, describes a cultural geography of our national game. Uh, the map includes information on baseball around the world, a uh, description of how the game is played, a uh, timeline of the evolution of the game, as well as a description of the central drama of the game, information on baseball records, and even the speed of the baseball as compared to sprinters, cyclists, and even animals. It's faster than a cheetah. Um, though not overly large, the map's uh, about 39 inches by 27 inches. Uh, it is printed front and back, um, but it contains a wealth of information uh, and may require a magnifying glass uh, for full enjoyment. And on an interesting side note, this one was actually produced right here in Minneapolis by a company called Hedberg Maps. Uh, this 1984 map of the Olympic Games in Los Angeles is a good example of how maps can provide that extra context and information. You see all the different sports over there on the right-hand side. And on the back of the map, in a time before smartphones and the internet, you needed a good map if you were going to get to the right venue for your favorite sport. Um, I like these. This is a set of maps from 2018 for the Paralympic Winter Games in South Korea. Um, and at a first glance, you can see that there are um, a, a pair of maps in both Korean and English. But if you zoom in closer, um, they're in Korean and English and also in Korean Braille and English Braille. Uh, this is a 1990 map of the layout of sport facilities for the 11th Asian Games with text both in Chinese and English um, and helpful, car helpful cartoon bear guide to all the sports. All right, now we're going to look at some maps related to leisure. We'll start with some beer and wine maps. So combining tourism with beer, this 2014 Brewcation Destinations map uh, shows statewide brewery locations for Minnesota. Um, and, you know, with the rate that breweries are popping up these days, this 2013 map of the Twin Cities beer situation is probably outdated. But in addition to brewery locations, it has a lot of useful information, such as the 12 regional brands from before Prohibition. I bet you didn't know there were 12. Although this 1976 map calls itself a wine map of the world, um, it is suspiciously Europe focused. Um, does have a small detail map at the top showing growing locations for wine around the world. Um, and it has a lot of specific notes on wine from different regions. Uh, getting more specific, this is a 1997 quote, zesty full bodied guide to the Loire Valley wine region. And it includes not just wine growing areas, but also hotels and restaurant information and pricing. And for each region within the Loire Valley, very specific information for that area. Um, a little closer to home, this uh, Vineyards and Wineries of California map is from 1989. It shows wineries around the state uh, with symbols to indicate the number of cases per year uh, that they produce. 
Uh, we have one culinary map here, sort of. This one's for fun. This is Minnesota principal hot dishes by region. Um, on the right is the Twin Cities area. We're not, we won't have any arguments or discussions right now. I'm just, just information. Um, this is the Southern part of Minnesota. The middle part of Minnesota and the Northern part of Minnesota. I have no idea what the data sources were for this map, um, but for your, for your convenience, it is printed on a dish towel. All right, I'm gonna move on to some uh, maps related to literature and entertainment. So here we have a literary map of Minnesota from 1954. Um, the detailed sections shown are uh, related to Paul Bunyan, um, in the upper right, the book uh, Canoeing with the Cree, and of course, uh, three of Wanda Gog's Millions of Cats. Uh, this Minnesota writer's map is from 1994. Um, Twin Cities writers uh, highlighted there on the right. And then we have the ones in northern Minnesota. Interesting detail here is that you see them repeated. So people either had vacation homes or moved around and got listed more than once. Um, and then here is the southern half of the state. Um, a slightly more modern, this 2013 map also highlights Minnesota writers, though updated to include more modern examples, uh, oops, such as Anton and David Troyer and Louis Erdrich. Uh, this is a 1934 map of Sinclair Lewis's United States, quote, as it appears in his novels. So you can see there's a detail on the left of Gopher Prairie and on the right, the fictional state of Winnemac. Uh, this is a map of American literature from the 1950s. Uh, it contains a lot of information, um, including many authors and titles that I, with an undergrad degree in English literature, have never heard of. Uh, here's a similar map, 1957. This one is showing historical fiction authors and titles, um, including many, many obscure titles. This 1957 literary map of the United States chose to represent the titles pictorially. Um, details here include Paul Bunyan and Davy Crockett. Um, detailed sections chosen carefully as many of the depictions also have not aged well. Uh, here we have a map. This is from a watercolor painting map from 2015 showing the geographical distribution of Shakespeare's plays with accompanying illustrations uh, from England to Central Europe to Southern Europe and the Middle East. In a slightly different vein, here's a folklore music map of the United States from the 1950s. Um, again, detailed sections chosen carefully because many of the depictions have not aged well. All right, so now let's look at some truly imaginary maps. Um, here we have Paul Bunyan's pictorial map of the United States depicting some of his deeds and exploits. Uh, this was published in 1935. So it includes depictions of some of the legends, such as how the Mississippi River was started and how Minnesota's 10,000 lakes were formed. Uh, for those of you that remember Mad Magazine, um, which apparently does still kind of exist, um, they published this mad pictorial map of the United States in 1981. So here we see some details of Minnesota on the left, on the Southeast Atlantic coast on the right. I think my favorite one is the hockey fight happening in Canada. Um, and maybe the space shuttle launch over there. Uh, the back side of this map has details for Los Angeles, New York, Hawaii, and Alaska, including this interesting detail. So maybe we've come full circle, you know, again, after this. Um, continuing on a theme of politics in the 1980s, this World According to Ronald Reagan map um, was published in 1984. Uh, here we have an all world monster map. So this was published in 1999. Uh, it shows monsters from folklore, mythology, and fiction from around the world. And in case you're wondering, quote, these monsters have been duly certified all world by the International Monster Commission. And now we, we do actually have, as an aside, we have a classification. All of the maps in the library are classified according to the Library of Congress classification. There is a classification for maps of imaginary places. It's at the very end, but it does exist. Um, so now we get into maps that are truly imaginary. Uh, to start, we have the series of five maps created from using the titles of books, films, songs, television shows, and bicycles. Um, so here, this is the uh, this is the book map. Here we see things like Northanger Abbey, located within Mansfield Park on the shores of Lake Wobegondays. Um, these maps were produced between 2012 and 2015. Uh, this is the film map. 
So here we have the Temple of Doom, the Two Towers, Lake Placid, and Pan's Labyrinth, all inside Jurassic Park. Uh, the song map is particularly dizzying, um, but it shows clearly where Positively 4th Street turns into Pacific Coast Highway and the specific location of Jenny from the Block. Uh, each map seems to be styled to resemble an actual city. This one's definitely Washington, D.C. Um, and it correctly labels the West Wing location. Uh, but you can also land on Project Runway on Gilligan's Island. Uh, the bike map is perhaps the one that's least like the others. Uh, they must have really, someone in this artist collective that made these must have really liked mountain biking. Uh, but it's helpful to know where the town of Schwinn is located, perhaps. Uh, here we have a map of online communities where the size of the map represents the volume of daily social activity based on data gathered over the spring and summer of 2010. So it's definitely outdated today, but locations like the Desert of Food Updates or the Plains of Awkwardly Public Family Interactions are probably still relevant, though I suppose the Desert of Food Updates has moved to Instagram from Twitter at this point. Um, now onto the more fantastical. So here's a map of Narnia. Uh, with some nice illustrative details. This one was published in 1972. Um, here's a pretty classic map of Middle Earth. So stylistically very similar to the maps that appeared in Tolkien's novels. But here's Middle Earth reimagined in the style of Google Maps. Uh, here we have maps from A Song of Fire slash Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire, excuse me, slash Game of Thrones. Uh, this one depicts Westeros. And here we have Essos on the other side of the Narrow Sea, also in a Google Maps style. Um, here we have the Marauders map from um, Harry Potter. This map sadly is not animated. It does not show any footsteps wandering around the map. However, it does have all kinds of fold out parts for viewing different parts of the grounds in and around Hogwarts. Uh, here we have a map of the Mushroom Kingdom from the Super Mario Brothers. Uh, which includes some uh, fun details of the game. And one more video game map. Uh, this time it is Castlevania. All right, and lastly, from the imaginary to imagery, in this case, aerial imagery, uh, our collection currently includes over 360,000 historical aerial photographs and images. Um, and here we're going to see, this is sport related, um, here we're going to see the evolution of an area in Bloomington, Minnesota. So the area on the far left starts off as farmland, and from left to right we see 1945, 1956, and 1960. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Metropolitan Stadium, shown here, is where the Minnesota Twins and the Minnesota Vikings played from 1961 to 1981. So we have 1960 on the far left, now it's or on the far right, now it's 1960 again on the far left, 1974, and then it starts to get taken down, 1984, 1984, 1987, and the start of the Mall of America, there's 1991. And you can see why the home plate for Met State Metropolitan Stadium is inside the Mall of America. And then again, 1991, 1997, and then 2018. So showing the evolution from that, um, from that farmland all the way to the Mall of America. Um, if you enjoy comparing the past to the present, we do have a tool we have built in the map library. Uh, so this compares aerial photograph imagery from 1956 and 1966 to the present day imagery. So things like you can see Met Metropolitan Stadium on the left side of the split and the Mall of America on the right side of the split, and you kind of swipe back and forth between the two. Uh, the slides will be available and the link to that is there on the slide. All right, thank you for bearing with me on my quick whirlwind tour. Yes. So there is a link, a link to the slides there and a link to the bibliography of the 53 maps shown there. A few of them are digitized, but most of them are too new, which would be like post-1928. Um, so there's a link to our, our catalog record if you would like to come into the map library and, and visit. I'll, I'll bring a mic out for so our online audience can hear. Scoot right through. Yeah, sorry about that. There you go. I, I have a, a question, two questions about maps. First is when I was surprised on the shrimp thing, 
that you found shrimp on the menu. So I grew up going to a, a quite a kosher hotel, a, a very well-known, and never was there shrimp. So I'm wondering if you noticed when they added non-kosher onto the menu or if it was always there. That's question one. Mm -hmm. Question two, not related to your talk specifically, but maybe you know the answer. I had an argument with some friends today as to why the YWCA made the boys swim nude. You might guess what the answer is if you're Jewish um, about the public. And the, the, the question is, is there any documentation as to why the whys made the boys, little boys like myself, swim nude when we were kids? That sort one, of related to the country club thing. Yeah, I that is a good question for Ryan Bean, who's in charge of the YMCA archives. I am sure he has an answer to that. Um, I'm sure it's documented in the YMCA archives. I feel like, is Alex still here? Maybe Alex would know. No. <laughs> um, but to go back to your uh, question of shrimp, there wasn't a lot of menus to be found. Um, and I was, um, I was trying to look for, I mean, shrimp, I feel like everyone kind of knows that that is not kosher, but there were other examples of, of things being not kosher. What is interesting is um, a number of years ago, I actually had a PhD student come to use the archives who was specifically interested in that question about Jewish events writ large um, being kosher or not kosher. And so he was looking at menus across all of the different collections, which reminds us that we don't really know how people are going to use the archives, right? Someone might be like, oh, well, in a menu like who's going to be interested in a menu that's all he wanted to look at so i don't know when because there aren't that many menus for me to compare um but that one was from uh, in the 1960s do you have any online yeah we have a online suggestion for a map of the University of Minnesota campus that allows you to move backward and forward in time. And I don't know if we have anyone that exists that online. Exists. Yes. Um, yeah, if, if you if you Google UMN campus history, 1860 to the present, you can see it. Of course. <laughs> so another map question, what is the oldest aerial photos you have for Minnesota? That's a good question. The, uh, so aerial photographs generally, um, the oldest ones we have for Minnesota specifically are uh, 1923 St. Paul, and that was, uh, they're, they're not terribly crisp, but I think it was two people, two guys who came back from World War I and had done some aerial surveying as part of the war effort and decided to fly over St. Paul and take pictures. Um, generally speaking, it is the agricultural um, stability and commodity service kind of the precursor to the farm service agency they started flying whole counties in the 1930s so washington county 1936 is the earliest kind of whole county uh, but by 1941 they had covered the entire state of minnesota I, I, you alluded to uh, google a couple of times and to online maps and uh you showed us paper maps and my question is what's the future of paper maps we love paper maps um <laughs> i know that but what's the well and the, the kind of the short answer is one of the reasons we love paper maps is because i know what to do with them i put them in a drawer and we can we can keep them uh digital maps we're still we're still working on uh you know as an example property records um plat books if you're familiar with those they uh we collect plat books for minnesota we have them going back to the late 1800s for almost every county um, you know, starting in the 1960s and 70s, maybe almost every five years because they were being published. They don't publish them anymore. Uh, they do, but it's hard to find. And most counties have digital records and they don't necessarily save older copies of those digital records. And so uh, the future is digital for the maps. And we're working on how to capture that for scholarship long term. We have an online question. Did the Hillcrest Country Club ever open membership to non-Jewish members? Yes. Um, I wasn't able to, so I was interested in like the actual application form and was able to find one blank um, application form that I, based on the 
logo, I think came from the eighties and nineties. And that application form uh, asked for your social security number. Um, but it did not ask, um, what your kind of religion or background was in a way that, you know, um, the, uh, general college application would ask, you know, what is your religion to get into a college, but for the country club, um, it, I could not find a definitive answer that you have to be Jewish to be a member of the country club. So, um, that, my my assumption is that they would allow anyone. If you look at names of of members, you can kind of get an idea, but that itself is also dangerous because names don't always necessarily connote, uh, especially the farther along you get in years. Oh. Um, how and where do you acquire such an odd collection of maps? <laughs> Um, I cannot take credit for any paper maps acquired before 2005 or 2007, say that. Um, I think the maps came from all over and maybe my own experience is what was, what happened in the past as well. Uh, the, the sort of central tenet of map collecting is that maps are ephemeral and they're often, you know, produced and not easily reproduced. And so, um, like the, the Google maps versions of Tolkien's Middle Earth, I think I saw them online somewhere and we bought a, we bought copies of them for the library. Um, so it's. For a lot of subject areas, um, you can kind of have plans set up where they, you know, publishing companies send you books, or, you know, you get suggestions from faculty or students or researchers, but I always kind of have my eye out for weird cartographical things that I want to add to the collection. Okay. I think we have time for those last two. How, how many map libraries to as big as yours are there in the United States? There's more than you'd think. Um, the Library of Congress is the largest uh, by far. Um, the American Geographical Society Library is located at the University of Milwaukee. Um, they're pretty big. Penn State has a really large collection. We have a big collection. Uh, UC Santa Barbara has a large collection. Um, there's not usually more than one per state and there I don't think is even one per state at this level. Um, so unscientifically, 15, 20, <laughs> somewhere in there. Historical societies do, um, they're far more focused though on their own area. And so the, the ones that collect broadly into the hundreds of thousands of maps. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for, and that's the other thing too, is that historical societies, like that's one place that I send people to a lot because they have very specific stuff that we don't have and other like kind of related documents. Is there one a quick more? question about the golf clubs. Um, big focus on charity and donations to DACA. Uh, you mentioned a bunch of upper-class women. Any focus on um, teaching golf to less uh, prosperous uh, Jewish kids in your records there? No, <laughs> not that I could find. Um, but during the summers, uh, kids, you know, the, the buses, the busing of people from the JCC, that was specifically for kids. Um, but those are kids of members. But um, like I said, a lot of these uh, clubs, especially in the early years, would be private and then public and then private. So it is possible during those public years um, that there was some sort of outreach, but I don't have documentation of that. But my assumption is that there wasn't um, any sort of outreach to anyone who wasn't a member, because that's how they supported themselves, right, by, by membership. All right, everyone, we are out of time for more questions. Thank you very much for attending. If you would like a tour of the storage facilities underground, please meet up with Aaron, who's in the back there. Wonderful. And uh, we also invite you to enjoy the Sherlock Holmes exhibit, which is in the gallery across the hall and also on the lower level in the Wallen Center. This is the last day, so take your opportunity now to go see the wonderful exhibit. Thanks for attending this season. We'll be back in October with a new season of First Fridays.